All right, what's up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here. Thank you so much for tuning in to GSD Interviews. Before we jump into this interview, I want to give our sponsors a quick plug that make this show possible. So our first sponsor is our real estate software, www.perfectstormnow.com, the most affordable and effective lead generation software out there. This isn't just a website. Yeah, we've got a website. Yeah, we've got a blog feature. Yeah, we have a, a testimonials and, and video client testimonials feature. We have community pages. We have all of, of the typical website stuff. What we differentiate ourselves is on the lead generation. We teach you how to lead generate. This, this system is extremely effective with lead generation. We can teach you how to go out there and generate more leads than you can handle um, without spending a, a penny on lead generation, right? Um, not only, though, do we teach you how to lead generate, not only is it a great website, um, it's, it's a coaching platform combined with, with software. So we have two, uh, uh, two monthly live training sessions that are two hours long um, with myself personally. So we teach you how to use the site, how to generate with the site, how to leverage the site. And, and it goes deeper than that. Okay, I'm getting all these leads. What do I do? What do I say? How do I convert these leads? So we go and train you and coach you on every aspect of that so you can go out there and dominate it in your business. So you have access to me, my developers on a daily basis as a customer of ours. So it's 99 bucks a month, um, no contracts, no uh, registration fees. It's month to month, 99 bucks a month. You can't beat it, right? So go check us out, www.perfectstormnow.com. Our next sponsor is My Personal Mentorship. You know, if you're ready to take your business, your life, your career to the next level, uh, we've got our My 90 Day ba uh, Mastery Boot Camp, which is a, a mentorship with me personally. Every single week, it's three hours or two hours of live coaching and training with me and then one hour of live Q&A. You have daily access to me and our private mastermind. Um, we build out your playbook. Every, every aspect of the residential real estate business from, from how to lead generate to how to lead follow up to how to do your presentations to how to build out your database um, to even start talking about how to grow a team, how to hire, how to fire. There's nothing that we do not cover inside that program. Then after the program's done, after the initial 12-week program's done, um, it's an ongoing platform. It's 50 bucks a month uh, where you have access to me for as long as you want. You know, right? And in that $50 a month program, you guys, I've made that where $50 a month is more powerful than a $1,000 a month coaching program that you can get anywhere else. So we do um, <coughs> four hours of, of monthly coaching at 50 bucks a month. So you get four hours of, of live coaching. Uh, we have two in-person masterminds here in Phoenix, Arizona. They're every six months. It's a private mastermind with uh, me and only the alumni bootcamp members that are part of the uh, mentorship. We don't bring in guest speakers. There's nothing to sell. There's none of that crap that we all get at all these other uh, seminars that we go to. You usually go pay 500 bucks for a seminar and they try to sell you a bunch of shit. That's not what this is. This is hardcore masterminding. This is a hardcore mentorship masterminding growth program. Uh, so if you guys want to learn more about that, www.90daymastery.com. Hope to see you guys in the program. All right, let's jump on into the interview. Hopefully you enjoy this as much as I did. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD interview. Every single week, we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses, you guys. They're out there dominating their space. They're choosing to not play small in life, not live a life of mediocrity, but to go out there and do big things with this uh, short gift called life that we have. So today, you guys, I've got Angelo Romero on the, the call today as a guest. Really stoked, really honored. Um, welcome to the show, my friend. Josh, thanks for having me, mate. How are you? Uh, doing amazing, bro. Doing amazing, man. I, I, I've been really looking forward to having you on for a while. I mean, you're a dude that um, really really has come from nothing. You, you, you dropped out of school at a young age, and you went, went out there and you've done a lot of massive, massive things with your life. Uh, before we jump into what you're doing today, though, dude, let's rewind the clocks and... Talk about how you got into entrepreneurship. Like, what was that journey? You dropped out of school at, like, 14. Like, what led you into this space in the first place? Mate, thank, great question. Thanks for asking. Look, well, as you said, I dropped out of school at 14. So I've got no formal education whatsoever, right? And the reason why I dropped out of school at such a young age was um, for the purpose to chase my lifelong dream of, of playing professional soccer, right? I've literally been dreaming to be a professional soccer player ever since I was five years old. And... I managed to make that dream come true. And uh, it was probably one of the best moments of my life, mate, to be honest with you, because just think about it. Um, there are so many kids out there trying to play the game and dreaming of becoming pros. But the reality of the fact is that not many of them succeed. I believe that the, the statistic, mate, is like 0.4% of you know high school kids here in the US 
um, that want to be pro soccer players actually achieve a, a professional level and play in the MLS. So imagine what the statistic is for folks worldwide, right? So I quit school at the age of 14 because um, I wanted to, I had to move to another city um, to train twice a day to give myself the best possible shot of, of you know, achieving the, the success there. And I made it come true. At the age of 18, I played professional soccer for around six months in Hong Kong, which was, you know, as I said, just a dream come true and one of the best moments of my life. Um, and look, what happened there, mate, is, is soccer um, and what I found out, baseball and basketball and NFL here in the US is a lot about politics, right? And it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that's when it can really get shitty. And I was exposed to a lot of that at a very young age. And unfortunately, I didn't have the backing behind me of the right people that could push me through that shit. So with a very heavy heart, mate, I decided to hang up the boots. At the age of 19, I literally said, you know, I just don't see myself plugging away at this sport. And you know what? I, actually, I probably had a bit of doubt, mate, that um, I could actually achieve the success that I needed to achieve by the age of 30, right? Now, I've broken my left leg twice, my nose three times, my wrist, my pinky, I've torn groins, hamstrings, I mean, you name it. So if in, in professional sport, if you don't achieve financial freedom by the age of 30, you're screwed. I mean, it's already pretty late in life to kind of start looking at what profession to do now, especially for me, I quit school at the age of 14. So I just said, you know what, let's hang up the boots now and let's venture out into the world and see what else is out there for me, right? The only job that I could get, mate, was um, laboring, right? So I worked as a laborer on dirty construction sites in Sydney. Um, but once again, I kept dreaming about something bigger and better out there for me. Got given a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Changed my world, even though I found out a lot of other crap associated with that book later on in my life, which I'm not going to go into too much detail here, mate. But um, look, changed my world, started thinking differently. I started thinking about business, entrepreneurship, finance, stocks real estate, anything and everything that could, that could you know, give me cash flow and secure my financial future. Um, got into real estate um, after cold calling someone who was, who's right now has a $100 million business in Australia. I stalked this guy for six months, um, finally got through. Josh, he gave me a job, worked under him for a good year and a half, and he gave me the foundations um, uh, of me being the real estate investor and entrepreneur that I am today. So built a very large portfolio in Australia, um, almost lost my ass doing it. I had over a million dollars in debt, um, taking advice from the wrong people, quickly woke up and smelt the roses, figured out that investing in real estate based on hope that a property is going to go up in value is a recipe for disaster. Look at the numbers in the deal, baby. Make sure that those numbers are suiting your end goal and where you want to be producing cash flow, more money coming in than going out and the investment might be worth pursuing further, right? So once I saw that in my portfolio there, um, I was like, shit, now what? Where can I go and get enough passive income to secure my financial future and the financial future of my, of my family? And uh, mate, God bless America, the best, <laughs> the best country in the world popped up. And I was like, freaking hell, man. I mean, look at the deals over there. I mean, you can pick up properties in the Midwest for 10, 15, 20, 30 grand. And I just had to have it, mate. Left everyone, in, left everyone behind, great paying job. Um, family and friends, I was engaged at the time, that fell off, and um, here I am, mate, killing it, living yeah. the dream, baby. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it, man. So, so obviously, a, a lot of questions when it comes to the real estate front, 90% um, of our listeners are based in the real estate industry, and, and very interested in the investment side, but before we jump into there, dude, like you, you got this crazy drive to chase your dreams. You know, you, you started doing that at 14 years old. Like, where does that drive come from? I mean, did you have parents that really instilled that drive? Or uh, from 14 on till, till bringing you to the States, it's always been chasing that passion, that dream. Where does that come from? Mate, great question. Look, I just think it's, you know what I love? Grant Cardone's writing a book right now about being obsessed, right? Everything that I have ever taken um, on board, I've be, become obsessed with it. I was obsessed with soccer. I mean, while other people, while other teammates were partying and going out, I was working my ass off, mate. Winter, summer, it did not matter. I would be in bed by 9 a.m., I would eat well, I would train twice a day, I would make the biggest sacrifices that you could possibly imagine, mate. Everyone was calling me mad. They thought I was crazy. And then when I kind of lost that, that dream and I had to hang up the boots, you know, the next thing that I became obsessed with was business entrepreneurship and real estate in particular. Um, and that's, I guess that's where I get the drive, mate. I, I, I get the drive from becoming obsessed with something 
and just really this, there's this fire within mate that is that is burning so freaking strong and i mean people try to bring me down and they do all the time mate but i pick myself back up and keep uh, pick, pick myself back up dust myself off and keep moving forward mate. you can't turn that fire out and i always tell everyone they can take everything from you they can take your freaking clothes your car your money they can freaking take even your calm and client underwear and i've got some pretty good undies mate right but they can't take what they can't take away what's in here and what's in here. That is yours to keep, mate. So as long as you can keep that fire burning, right, and that obsession going, mate, you're good. You're golden. You are golden. Yep, love it. So okay, so you got this going on in Australia. You decide to leave everything there, come here to the states, leave everything, start from essentially scratch here again. How do you get that start, dude? Because so many people want to jump into this game and they watch HG, you know, TV and or read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Think it's so lucrative. But there's some massive struggles, man. How did you get your start? And what were some of those initial um, objections, not objections, but obscurity, or not obscurity, adversity that you had to overcome initially, man? Mate, well, well look, another great question. And, and look, I'm an Aussie in the US. So I could literally, we could, we could do this show for the next 10 hours and I still wouldn't be able to list all of the objections that I had to. I mean... Look at it this way, mate. At the end of the day, it just comes down to how bad you freaking want it. I mean, you have to sit your ass in the office at 6 a.m. and not leave literally day and night. Do what you have to do, whatever it takes, get to wherever where, where, wherever it is that you need to be, mate. Um, cold calls, emails, meetings, bust ass doing all of that shit nonstop. I mean, you know, as I said, Josh, I've had so many objections, it's hard to literally, you know, list how many I had from visa restrictions to being in a ton of debt to having health issues, my grandma dying, my mum getting diagnosed with cancer, fractured my left wrist, couldn't afford to fix it. Uh, you know, I had visa problems. I only had, you know, a bit of money to my name. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? I was literally at a stage around three years ago where I got everything taken away from me, mate. I had nothing. But once again, I had this. And I had this and I sat my ass in that office and I picked up the phone man and I just kept calling and calling and calling and emailing and emailing. And eventually after nine months of, of very tough times, I had a breakthrough, right? And that breakthrough enabled me to establish a relationship with a hedge fund. I sold 22 properties in like 60 days. And that's what started higher cash flow and the business that where we are right now and the business that we're doing today. Um, but yeah, mate, look, you have to work hard. You really have to work hard. You have to commit to the numbers, especially in real estate. If you're a realtor, if you're a flipper, I mean, it's all about the numbers. How many offers do you submit on a daily basis? How many clients do you speak to, right? How many properties do you inspect? So it's all about the numbers, mate. So when, you, when you're hitting up those hedge funds, man, I mean, what, were you coming at this from a real estate agent perspective or were you just, hell, I know I can find the deals based on what they want. I'll go to the trustee sales, whatever they want. I'll go out there and, and, and create the deals. I mean, what did that look like when you're down and out with nothing, you don't have the real estate. Like, like what, what's your pitch to them at that point? I had other people's real estate, okay? I, I had other people's real estate, um, and I was involved with a few partners back then where, you know, I got given 22 properties that I needed to liquidate at a rapid pace. And I kind of went from a project manager on site to all of a sudden being, you know, head of sales for properties that I had no freaking clue about. That's why it took me nine months to, to, to you know, liquidate all these properties. So, mate, fake it till you make it, Josh. What do you want me to tell you? I mean, I could call the White House right now and I'll probably get through to Barack Obama as long as I've told them it's the dingo calling and it's urgent. I'm calling from Sydney, Australia. So, look, I've, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've got an accent, so it makes me very unique. People want to talk to me and, and people think that there's kind of a sense of urgency and priority when I call. So, I'm very fortunate in that department. But um, ultimately, mate, yeah, look, I was presenting these properties. I was looking for someone to, to buy them. Um, if someone did not have the capacity to buy them, I was asking for referrals if they knew someone that was looking to buy them, right? And, and this is a couple of years ago when, when there was a lot of hedge fund activity going on in Kansas City and Missouri where I was based at the time. Um, there still is a lot of hedge fund activity going on there. Uh, it's kind of quieted down quite a bit now. There aren't that many hedge funds buying around. I'm hoping that they, that they come here to Ohio um, in, in around three years' time while I own freaking thousands of properties, yeah? <laughs> not yet. But um, yeah, mate, that's kind of that's kind of the, the version of, of you know how I went about looking for establishing these relationships with someone that could either purchase these properties or assist with referring someone else that might have the capacity to purchase them, right? Yeah, no, I love that, man. So how do you go from liquidating these properties? Because you know I think today, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're you're overseeing like fifty million dollars in, in, in real estate, right? 
Um, how, how do you go from that to overseeing cash flowing properties at that massive capacity? Yeah, I've, I've actually been involved in $50 million worth of real estate transactions. So that would be from, I started my real estate journey four and a half years ago. Now keep in mind, that figure sounds really sexy here in the US, that's why I use it. But in Australia, the average median house price is like a million dollars, okay? So don't tell anyone, please. <laughs> a little bit of a marketing gimmick there. No, mate, look, that, the sale of those 22 properties gave me the necessary capital to start the higher cash flow, okay? Um, I already had a higher cash flow in the plans. I had over 50 things on the to-do list that needed to be executed on before we could start this grand company, which is now known as one of the most reputable and best branded in the country. Um, selling those 22 properties gave me the starting capital to move from Kansas City, pay off a few debts, get out of the shit storm that I was in at the time and kind of start a new beginning here in Toledo, Ohio, where we are today. Um, so, mate, look, it all comes with preparation. I mean, you, you, you have to be prepared. You have to plan, right? How does, it, how, does, how, how does that saying go, mate, where preparation means practice or something like that, you know, is when, is when perfection occurs, right? Something like that. Anyway, um, so, you know, as I said, I had a lot of things on the to-do list that I had to execute on. Um, which I slowly was executing on, but the big game changer was liquidating those 22 properties, getting a cash injection, getting out of the sour partnerships that I was, that I was in at the time, moving to Toledo, and then slowly starting to work on the website. Slowly starting to work on, on mate, I created our websites from nothing. Like, it's just insane. I didn't have much money to do it, so I had to do it myself. But um, yeah, you get my drift there. Yeah, now, so, you know, and, and I know today, I mean, you're going big into the rental property game, right? I mean, cash flow, flipping game is, I mean, I've never been a big fan of flipping because it's like, you go out there, you flip a property, and then you're broke again. I'm not, not broke again, but it just becomes, it's a rat race, dude. So what keeps, like, what steered you in that direction compared to flipping, which is kind of the sexy thing to do, um, or just continuing to liquidate these properties for other hedge funds and other organizations? Sure, mate. So when I first moved to the U.S., right, um, uh, 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 I was very restricted on what I could and could not do. Right, I was on a visa where I could not work. So the only thing that I could do was sign a contract to buy a property and sign a contract to sell a property. Now, when I was in Australia, I got into a ton of debt. I built a very large portfolio in a short amount of time. All of the media there was was you know saying that I was this cash flow kid. They loved me, but no one knew that I was actually losing money on my monthly mortgage repayments. Um, with hope that these properties were going to go up in value. So when I came to the US, I had a cash flow mindset. I wanted to buy and hold as many properties as I possibly could, right? So those properties could generate cash flow so I could live life on my terms. Now, when I moved here, I moved with a limited amount of money, right? And when you have a limited amount of money, you can't buy and hold properties because it's not going to be significant enough to give you the desired cash flow so you can retire. So the the only other strategy, mate, that I had was as I told you, I'm allowed to sign a contract to buy and sign a contract to sell, right? So that's kind of how this, this business that I'm in right now, where we buy rundown properties, we renovate them, we get them tenanted, and then we sell them to investors as a complete turnkey package, right? So all our investors have to do is sit back, relax, and collect the rent. I initially started this business for the purpose of being able to grow my portfolio, right? Because buy and renovate and sell three, buy, renovate, and hold one. Right, and the more I can hold, the sooner I can get my ass back to freaking Australia and start surfing on the beach again. Right now, what has happened is in in this entre- in this in this business, you know, when you become a business owner and when you become an entrepreneur, I guess I started the journey about me. Once I kind of got to a stage where I'm comfortable, the journey about me kind of stopped. It's about everyone else right now. As, as corny as that sounds, mate, but it really isn't about me. Like, look, you've got masterminds that you hold, and it's not about you. You don't give a shit about getting an extra 20, 30, 40, 50 K. It really is about these other people and how much you can give back. And, and, and I know it sounds corny, but that's the truth, mate. That's generally what's in my heart. So that's kind of how, you know, we've still got this business. We're still running this awesome company. We're still meeting the needs of other investors. And this is the first year that I have actually been buying a ton of properties for my portfolio, right? So I'm looking at buying between 25 to 50 single family homes here in Ohio just for my portfolio. And that is going to cash flow like you will not believe, mate. Um, all righty? Yep. No, I love it, man. So, so and this is a question I always ask all the real estate investors in the show as far as with your tactics. Because you some people that love single family attached, some people that love the multi-units. Um, do you do you diversify in all of the above, or 
you know, do you attack single family for, for a certain reason? Mate, look, predominantly focusing on single family homes right now. I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an expert in that field. I know the numbers really well. Um, I can literally buy the property sight unseen just based on a piece of paper. I've got project managers that will go out on site and inspect the properties. And that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, uh, we've, we've been doing really well with single family homes. A lot of people have become to know us. I have come to know us because of the single family homes. I'm actually looking at a duplex right now that we might buy. We do the odd four unit here and there. Haven't expanded uh, um, uh, into commercial and multifamily, larger multifamily complexes. I think that is on the horizon. Um, we'll see how we go. But right now, mate, you know, single family homes are our bread and butter. I enjoy doing them. I'm buying a ton of them for my portfolio. And I think that a lot of the investors in our target market and, and our target, you know, buyer uh, is kind of in that, in that, for lack of a better word, that lower lower wealth bracket, right? They don't have millions and millions of dollars to spend where they can just go out and buy a you know, 500 unit complex. So that is kind of how we have branded ourselves. That is our target market. That is our target buyer. So we just meet the demand of those investors. But you know, I am excited with what the future is going to bring because I, I have my eyes on, on, on four units to start and then we can always you know, grow from there. So give us an idea dude, of what you're doing with the single family attached because we've got a lot of listeners that want to jump in that game but man they're so they're, they're working 100 hours a week they don't have time to mess with them and, and, and manage them and, and I know you've got a turnkey product so give us an idea of, of kind of what you guys are doing with that and then also if they want to reach out to you um, to potentially get an investment with you like what, what's the best way to reach you for that sure look so pretty much Josh what we do is we buy rundown distressed properties via any means necessary okay we do a lot of yellow letter campaigns Craigslist ads I mean my whole building is is blue and yellow literally and it says we really do buy houses on the side of it I mean it's ridiculous um, once we buy these rundown properties we renovate them to a rate standard we've got four plus contractors working for us around the clock um, I've got in-house property management it's a company controlled and owned by me um, I do not believe in a turnkey outfit having an outsourced property management company. It just does not work. They will nickel and dime you to death. Property management does not make money from the 10% monthly fees. They make money from getting new tenants into your property. Okay, So we've got in-house property management. And once the properties are tenanted, we sell them to investors. East Coast, West Coast, UK, Canada, Australia, recently expanded into Asia. I mean, I've got investors from Madagascar out of all of the places, right? Um, very limited, very exclusive in what we do. We're not about selling thousands of properties to hundreds of investors. If you're an asshole, I don't want to work with you. I turn down more business than I take on, and that is no joke, right? So that's kind of what we do, mate. Um, you know, and, and if anyone wants to reach out to us, I mean, we're very loud and proud with our branding. Google is the best business card, www.ohiocashflow.com. They can check us out. Um, I hate talking about myself and my business, mate. So let's let's give more content to everyone. Come on, <laughs> I'm starting to blush here, dude. No, nah, well, well, see, well, you know, man, we we, we got to do it, right? Because again, it, it, and I and I appreciate you being so humble, but I know so many people that are in this space that again they have the income, they want to do it, but they're just so damn busy doing what they want to do. They need that turnkey product, and there, there's very few people that have that out there. I mean, you're you're only one of a few that I've ever met. In my entire real estate career that has that. So I think Josh, was- there actually is quite a few of us out there, but everyone has a shit reputation, right? Yeah. If you mention turnkey, it's like you're the devil, 666. Properties in shit areas with shit property management sold at way more than what they're worth, right? So, you know, here we are, we've changed that demographic, right? We've turned a lot of heads because we do offer a genuine product and a genuine service. And, and, and you know, it's, it's um, I'm excited, mate, with where we're going, but um, it's all, it also saddens me that there's a lot of folks out there that are doing the wrong thing. And, and it's got a very bad reputation, mate. I'll tell you what, turnkey really is the devil. I mean, I post a lot on bigger pockets. I write blogs there. I've done a podcast. Um, if, if you mention that you're a turnkey provider or selling a turnkey product, you get smashed. And I mean, absolutely smashed. So it is what it is, mate. We're, we're trying to change, change that stigma. Um, and so far, we're doing well. So with your experience, man, I know you also work with so many other investors that have dabbled in this space on their own as well. What are a few of the biggest mistakes that you see, whether entry level or, or novice investors making that, that are really forcing them out of the game? Great question, mate. Trusting the wrong people, okay? Trusting the wrong people. Um, I speak to so many investors on a daily basis, right? And um, 
it pisses me off when they start asking about the stats and demographics of a particular area, vacancy statistics of a market, what are the capital growth projections, blah, 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 all of that bullshit. Um, and mate, at the end of the day, I always tell them, you need to completely change your mindset. You need to focus on the people first, right? Teamwork makes the dream work. And I always like to give them this example. If you buy the best house in the best street, in the best area with the best capital growth projections, but your property manager is a cheat or incompetent, you're going to lose your rent because he's going to steal it, right? Or you won't know what to do with it. Or for example, on the other hand, I've got buddies, we're only an hour from Detroit, I've got associates that are making millions and millions of dollars in the heart of Detroit right now. Not because the market is booming, not because the stats and demographics are saying so, but because they have the right people on the ground that know what they're doing. They know their job, they know their role. Yes, they might have to collect the rents with bulletproof vests and shotguns. It doesn't matter. They know what makes the market work and they know their numbers. So that is the biggest mistake, mate, that I see people uh, 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 doing is, 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 you know, getting caught up in these stats and demographics, you know, getting caught up in the wow factor of a particular deal or a particular market. But the, rea the reality of the fact is that the, the people on the ground are the ones that are going to make or break that investment for them. So make sure that you establish relationships with, with key people that are about delay gratification. Real estate, Josh, is a long-term play. You can't achieve financial freedom overnight. It takes three, five, 10, 15 years to get to where you need to be. So everyone that's trying to make a quick sale and make a quick dollar off you, I don't think that they're the type of person you want to be doing business with. I think that you want to be doing business with, with someone that has you know, your best interest at heart over the long term, right? Three, five, 10, 15 years, okay? Yep, love it, man, love it. So you got 2.4 um, billion millennials you know, that, that exists right now. It's just, it's just insane. And a lot of these millennials saw their parents just get crushed in the last real estate market crash. So we're seeing a lot more renters, which is very lucrative for investors. But I mean, do, do you have any strategies for specific markets or, or where these millennials are moving to as far as your overall strategy to be successful with investing? Great question, mate. All right, check this out. I've got I just checked out the, the typical demographic of our investor base, and most of them between 35 to 50 years old, okay? Now, why they're kind of in that, in that range um, is because I'm very similar to you, mate. I really don't give a shit about what anyone else says. I'm very loud and proud. I'll drop the F-bomb as much as I want. I'll do these crazy videos without any pants on and all kinds of fun stuff, right? <laughs> so everyone that's kind of in that older demographic, they don't really respect me. They don't like me, even though my reputation is clean. I encourage everyone to Google me, rip off, report me. $35 background search, hire a freaking private detective to follow me around. You will find nothing because I'm clean. So, mate, look, I think that the millennials and the folks in that 35 to 50-year-old bracket, I mean, they're looking for something different. Success comes from doing things differently, right? You've got to stand out from the crowd. Everyone is the same old boring bullshit, you know, type marketing, sale, pitch, blah, blah, blah. Be different no matter what it is. I mean, wear a pink jacket if you have to, wear bloody orange socks and, you know, call yourself the freaking orange sock agent or whatever it may be. So that would kind of be my best tip, mate, is just to be different. Stay, to, stay true to who you are. Stay true to your brand. There's going to be a lot of noise, right? No matter, even if you are doing the right thing, people will love you, people will hate you. Who cares? As long as they're talking about you, dude, as long as they're talking about you. So that would be my best advice there is just be different. Yeah, love it, man. So you mentioned Grant Cardone earlier in, in his new book that's coming out. And we've had Grant on the show, and, and he's been a mentor of mine personally for the last several years. Um, he, he, he's got a big belief system on you should never own where you live, right? Rent where you live, and then go out there and buy assets. Um, what's your personal take on that? 100%, mate. I rent a shitty little two-bedroom apartment right now, <laughs> right? Because look at it this way. This is the way I see it. Right. If you look at money as green little soldiers, right, and if you put those green little soldiers into a million dollar mortgage, right, they are sitting in a bunker. They aren't doing jack shit for you, right? They can't go out and fight. Well, how about putting those green little soldiers in buy and hold properties or in buy and fix and flips or in other investments? Those green little soldiers are out working for you. They're fighting for you. They're bringing more soldiers in and they're just expanding, right? They're, they're, they're taking over new territory. So, mate, 100%, 100%. I, I read a blog about it. I got smashed by a ton of people because I don't believe in the American dream, jibber jabber shit. I believe in the Angelo dream, baby. I want to do whatever the hell I want to do. I want to drive whatever car I want to drive. I want to live wherever I want to live. I don't want to be stuck to one particular location. I want to buy a property in, in, in Sydney, in Paris, in freaking Milan, in New York. I want to live everywhere, right? 
So yeah, mate, hundred percent. I think that every single penny should go towards investment. Um, once you have a substantial amount of cash sitting around and you want to go out and, and, and spend whatever it is that you want to spend on your dream property, whatever it may be, do it, but make sure that you've still got enough money in the kitty to go out and invest, right? So yeah, love it. Uncle G, mate. Yeah. Uncle G. <laughs> that's it. That's it dude. So, so let, let's say, you know, a lot of our listener base right now probably has a single family attached home that they've lived in that maybe has some equity in, um, but they want to start investing. I mean, if you've got somebody that has maybe 40, 50% equity in their property, how would you recommend, would you recommend that they take that cash out and start the investment compared to just selling and renting? Or, I mean, how, how would you recommend somebody get started in, in that position? Depends on how extreme you want to be and how much your wife's got you by the balls. I mean, you know, shit, I would sell it. I would sell it, mate. I would sell it and use that capital to, to triple it, to quadruple it, to buy more. I mean, Look, once again, it's a lot of people can't get caught out of that stereotypical American, you know, dream type view. And it sucks, mate. But ultimately, you know, we all end up in the same place, Josh. It's six feet under. You can't take anything with you. 90% of folks in retirement homes said that the biggest regret that they had in life was not traveling more, not spending more time with family, but taking more risk. They wish that they took more risk. So sell the bloody thing, go out there, take more risk. And so what if you lose it all? It doesn't matter, mate. And this is one of my favorite quotes. It doesn't matter how many times you're wrong as long as you're right once and it counts, right? Look at Mark Zuckerberg. Let's say that he started up 99 other companies before Facebook and they all failed. No one would give a shit because Facebook is Facebook, right? Same as you. Let's say you go out and lose $900,000 trying freaking nine times and that one time you make 10 million because you invested in the right company. Who cares about the others that you lost, right? So that would be my, my advice is um, I would sell it and then I would use those funds to, to, to you know, try and um, put those green soldiers to work. Yep, love it, dude. So what keeps you personally, man, going back on to you, what keeps you personally leveling up in life? We find that good becomes the worst enemy to greatness. It's so easy to get caught up in this. Things are good enough. You got money coming in. You could, you could pull the reins off and just kind of, co you know, coast and, 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 and not have to hustle as hard. What keeps you, bro, personally leveling up and chasing greatness, never settling for good enough? Well, that's a good question, mate. Shit, you almost got me stumped there, but I've got an answer for you. Um, look, my goals are pretty big, right? My goals are like ridiculous. So I've still got a long way to go before I can hit those goals. Um, uh, uh, another one would be, you know, seeing other people do better. And that kind of gives me not jealousy. I'm not a jealous guy. It gives me motivation to try and catch up, right? To someone like yourself, man. I mean, you're freaking killing it. I mean, I see your face on Facebook everywhere, right? I'm like, how the hell does this guy always get these sponsored bloody posts going and they stalk me around everywhere, right? So I, I kind of look up to folks like yourself, you know, I look up to folks like Uncle G, you know, and, and all of those other guys, how they, how they have this huge brand, this huge personality, you know, a lot of people following who they are and what they're doing. And then that motivates me and inspires me to also do better. Ultimately, mate, a big one for me is, is leaving a legacy, right? When everything is said and done, Josh, I want my last name plastered on a building, not like Trump Towers, but like Remora Institute for Cancer Research, right? I want, when everything is said and done and I'm gone and I am no more, I want something left behind that will continue, um, you know, serving a lot of people and helping a lot of people in need. And once again, it sounds corny, dude. I know it does. I don't give a shit what anyone else thinks. <laughs> I know it sounds corny, but that's the honest truth. So, when, when your kind of purpose and what you do is bigger than yourself and it's bigger than money, it's chasing that legacy, right? It's chasing that, that, that something that will help others. I mean, that's what inspires you. That's what motivates you. That's what gets your ass out of bed every single morning, mate. I mean, ultimately, you, you can't stop, dude. You just can't stop. It just keeps freaking pushing. That fire within is burning, man, and, and it just keeps burning like crazy. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and a lot of people can't grasp that, understand that, but you get to a certain level where – the money's irrelevant. It's so much bigger than that, dude. And a lot of people yep. can't can't relate. So so I dig it, man. So you know, uh, you mentioned before about reading rich Pat, rich dad poor dad, and you know applying some of those and realizing maybe they didn't work in your own world. And you know, and I've been guilty not with rich dad poor dad, but I do. I've spent half a million dollars on consultants and coaches and these quote unquote gurus that led me down a wrong path and and cost me a hell of a lot more money than, than it made me. Um, how do you know 
if you're on that right path or if you have that right mentor so you're not getting taken for all the smoke and mirrors, especially in your space, dude. Everybody's got this zero down, get rich, quit bullshit that exists out there. Mate, I'm not sure if you need to check out some of my videos. I've got this little campaign going right now where I'm slamming absolutely every reality TV flipping show. And I mean, I am slaughtering them because I'm, I'm pushing for my own TV show. And I'm very close to getting one. And, and there's my plug, mate. It's time to make them real again, right? If Donald Trump says it's time to make America great again, the dinger here is saying it's time to make reality TV flipping shows real again. Mate, look. Oh, wow. Great question, dude. Um, I don't know the answer to that, mate. I don't know the answer. I have never paid for any course. I've never paid for any mentorship. I've never paid for any coaching. I've never paid for any mastermind. I, I Look, I personally think that all of it is a bunch of bullshit, okay? To be honest with you, that is my personal belief. Um, I this is, this is the way I see it, mate. If you're sick and you want to get better, you go to the doctor, right? If your car breaks down and you want to fix it, you take it to the mechanic. If you want to learn how to make money in real estate, you go to someone that's doing it and you brush shoulders with them all day and every day as much as possible via email, messages, phone calls, whatever it may be, right? So that, those are my beliefs. Um, if you can find folks that you know, are willing to give you their time in that department, I think you're onto something. Now, don't get me wrong, mate. Once I get on TV and I get my TV show, I promise myself, um, Josh, I'm not selling seminars. I'm not selling DVDs, courses. I'll sell my time and you're freaking going to pay an absolute fortune for it, but you get me live. You get me one-on-one. -on -one. And that, those are my beliefs. When you can actually get someone on a, on a very kind of close personal level, that's when you can start flourishing in, in, in you know, real estate, right? So I hope that answers your question, mate. <laughs> yeah, no, I dig it, man. I love it, man. So, um, you know, you're, well, and going back to what you just answered there, I mean, you know, Australia, you found that mentor, the guy that did it. You know, so, okay, I didn't pay for a course, but you gave up a percentage of your life to go follow up the mentor. And, and you know, people just, it seems like, man, people just aren't willing to do that. They want free advice. They're not willing to, to go chase that mentor. So go into that because I think that that's such an important topic of, of finding that right mentor. Because somebody could, if they were serious, be like, hey, man, I'm going to go, I'm going to fly out to, uh, to Toledo um, I'll offer to, to scrub your toilets, work free for free, 50 hours a week, and learn that right way. How, how did you identify your mentor, um, and, and what did that process look like? Dude, I freaking love you for that question. I was almost going to drop the F-bomb there, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> look, uh, same as you, mate. I bet you any money you get inundated with people messaging you every single day, right? And then you send them this generic little reply, like follow me on Facebook, add me on Twitter, blah, blah, blah. No one comes back. Dude, for two years now, Josh, I've never ever had anyone re-message me again. If I just had one person re-message me again, I'd be like, shit, he's king. He's actually saying, you know, he's, 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 he's um, you know, not accepting rejection and he's coming back again, right? So, so mate, that's the key, right? Keep following up. Stay professional. Everyone wants something for nothing. And that really pisses me off. And I love what you said about scrubbing toilets, washing my car, freaking going to get me lunch. It doesn't matter. I would never accept anyone do that. But just the gesture of offering something, right, to me, in order to get something in return would be huge. And it would really catch my attention. And I would actually, you know, pay more, more attention to that particular individual rather than just sending them a generic email. Look, mate, I was, chasing, I was chasing my mentor for six months. I was calling. I was emailing. I, I you know, was going to, to reception at the office in a, in a very, very, very professional um, and, and genuine way. Right now, I'm chasing Uncle G2 in a very genuine and professional way, so I might have to chat to you after. I've already got his email. We correspond via email here and there. <laughs> but, um, you know, look, mate, if, if, once again, how bad do you want it? How bad do you freaking want it? Be professional, keep following up, and, and eventually these people, you'll catch their attention. They'll know who you are, and they won't be able to, to resist. Like right now, mate, I've got this, I've got another little campaign um, that we're doing. I was on the front cover of a, of a real estate investment magazine called Personal Real Estate Investor. It's changed the name now to Think Realty. You've probably heard about them. I was on the front cover there. And what we're doing now is we're going to be sending a copy of the magazine along with a funny little note and a box to entrepreneurs like, you know, Grant Cardone, Nito Cubain, um, you know, and, and a lot of Gary Vernachuk, a lot of these other high-end entrepreneurs out there to see if I can kind of catch their attention or at least leave an impression. 
to later on one day maybe continue the discussion with them, right? So yep, badass dude. So um, you're a dude that that's got a lot of energy, and every successful person that I meet, it seems like their energy has so much to do with their success. Do you have any type of a daily routine? I mean, you're an ex professional athlete. Do you have a t any type of a daily routine that really gets you into your daily power to do what you do right now? Well, um, look, no, not really. Um, I, I've got a very weird ass routine right now. So I'm normally in the office by around 8 a.m. Um, it's like freaking almost 8 p.m. right now, um, Eastern Standard Time. Um, and I'll finish around 6 or 7 p.m., right? And then what I like to do is go home for two or three hours sleep. And then I'm up from like 10 or 11 p.m. until 2 or 3 a.m right? Which is a very weird ass routine. I know. And then I kind of do the same thing over and over again. I'm getting a ton of stuff done, Josh. Um, it, we're kind of at a phase right now where I really need to step it up to take our business to the next level, bringing on more people, you know, looking to inject some invested money into the company to scale how many deals we're doing right now. Um, but look, for my morning routine, when my routine is normal, not crazy as it is right now, I like to be in the office by seven o'clock. Um, I like to, to you know, get up, um, have a coffee, go to the office. Um, I, I read a bi the Bible a little bit, a few pages of the Bible. Then I would kind of get into a few motivational articles, um, and then I would get into my day. Mostly starts with emails, phone calls, and then, I mean, shit hits the fan. My calendar's packed out for the rest of the day, right? Um, I do go to the gym in the afternoon, so that's something that I will do. But no particular routine, mate. I don't do any meditating. I don't do any yoga or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, boring. What is uh, – <laughs> no, I like it, man. What, what is uh, – I love the honesty, bro. Because everybody thinks that, like, I got to dial this in. And you know that so much of it's fluff of what they're telling you, right? Uh, um, uh, I mean, what's your self-development like, though, personally? I mean, do you, do, are, you, are you a guy – are you a reader? Um, I, I mean, how, are you a student in the game? What does that look like for you personally? Mate, you know what's funny? It takes me freaking two hours to read four pages, right? Mm. I, I've got, I just recently found out that I've got some bullshit, what do they call it? ADHD, yeah. right? So I read a sentence and my mind doesn't like the way I've read it, so I've got to reread it. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, I'm sweating like a freaking pig rereading the same bloody sentence, dude. Look, mate, um, seminars, conventions, experts, networking, dude. They ask me, Angela, you quit school at the age of 14. You've got, you, you type chop suey like this, your math sucks, your grammar's even worse, you're rude, you're loud, you, you suck. How the hell did you get to where you are today? You're running a multi-million dollar real estate investment company. And I always tell them, I ask questions of people who are where I want to be. How easy is that? Ask questions of people who are where I want to be. I've spent thousands on coffees and dinners, mate, right? Just by brushing shoulders with successful entrepreneurs and real estate investors. Um, so that is my self-development. Um, I try to read, mate. I, I'm, I've read two books this year, and my goal was to read 10. So I'm really pushing hard. I've got a book right now by um, Guy Kawasaki, ape, um, author, publisher, and entrepreneur, because I'm writing a book. Believe it or not, I can hardly write, but I'm still writing a book. Don't ask. <laughs> it's actually going well. I've got around 30,000 words into it, right? So um, yeah, mate, look, just, just asking questions of people who are where I want to be, and look, I, I go to a lot of seminars. I mean, I just flew out a couple of weeks ago to see um, uh, 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 Grant Cardone, Ty Lopez, Com Mirza um, talk in Vegas. So that was cool. I've got another one. I'll actually be speaking on stage with Kevin O'Leary and Vanilla Ice um, in August at the Think Realty Conference. Shitting my pants about that one, dude. Um, so yeah, mate, you know, just, just network. Your network equals your net worth. Yep, truth, man. So, you know, I know you get interviewed all the time about what you do, what your journey's been, um, real estate investing, all the tactical things in between. Is there ever um, like a question that you wish people would ask you or that you think is important that they would ask you that nobody ever asks you? Yep, there is, mate. There is. I did actually get, uh, and you're right, look, I've done hundreds of interviews, hundreds, and, and no one has ever asked um, how hard was it to move from Australia to the US? And what I mean by that is emotional, right? Because all they see is, you know, me freaking going to the Bahamas and running with higher cash flow and doing these interviews and videos and killing it, right? But no one ever asks, how hard was it? So I wish people would ask that question and I wish, I wish people would just acknowledge how difficult it was to make that move, right? Forget about the success, forget about the cars, forget about all of that shit, mate. Just think about it this way. Pack up Josh right now, you know, with one bag and piss off into the unknown, dude. 
you are a foreigner there. You don't know anything. You don't know anyone. The system is different. I couldn't have a bank account. Dude, I, look, it was an absolute nightmare. People did not understand. You know, people don't understand how hard that aspect of it is. I was depressed for a good year and a half when I moved to the US. And I mean depressed out of the ass, mate. Like tough times. So that's the one question, mate, that I wish people would ask. And, and I wish that people would actually take their hat off and say, mate, just even if you had nothing right now, if you were if you were broke, right, but you actually adapted to a new country, a new lifestyle, a new system, I salute you for that. So, yeah, man, there yeah. you go. <laughs> uh, it's, it's amazing. Well, I mean, dude, like I said in the beginning, I mean, you're this guy that just chases your dreams, no matter how difficult, how crazy, how insane, which is which is killer, man. It's brilliant, right? So, um, what were Cause it drives me crazy when people are like, hey, man, I'm living in San Diego, let's say. But they have this lifestyle to become a successful entrepreneur. I'm like, well, dude, move to Phoenix. That same house that costs you 800 grand will cost you 150 out of here. You know, right? Sell the Mercedes, get the Honda Civic, make those <laughs> sacrifices that you can invest that money. But then people aren't willing to do it because they're just they're truly interested, not committed. You know, so what were some of those crazy um, um, obstacles that you had to overcome that – you never would have thought possible when coming from Australia to the U.S. Mate, check this out. So as I mentioned, when I had that tough, tough patch where, you know, my grandma passed, my mom got diagnosed with cancer, broke my left wrist, felt like the whole world was caving in on me, had over a million dollars in debt, sour business relationships, credit card debts. I mean, you name it, too. I mean, it was a nightmare. I was eating peanut butter for breakfast and drinking $1 gas station coffees to survive. Okay, so mate, you can't get any lower than that, dude. I mean, that's a big time reality check. And and look, desperate times call for desperate measures. So so when you're in such a vulnerable state, um, and I always tell people this: if you can actually train your mind to put it in a desperate situation and desperate position, like mine is right now, we're comfortable, we're doing well, but I'm desperate. I'm desperate, Josh, to take it to the next level, right? I'm desperate to add more staff. I'm desperate to do more deals. I'm desperate to get to that that next level and, and achieve my legacy, right? So, I mean, look, sacrifices have to be made, dude. Sacrifices have to be made. How can you how can you think you can achieve something without making sacrifices, right? I became a professional soccer player at the age of 18 because of all the shit I was willing to sacrifice 15 years prior to that, right? Not going out, not partying, eating well, training hard. You know, I love the saying by Ray Kroc, yeah, I wasn't over success. I wasn't overnight success, but 30 years is a long, long night, right? That's what Ray Kroc said, the founder of McDonald's, right? So look, you have to make sacrifices. And one of the sacrifices would be selling your American dream home, using the money to invest, moving from San Diego or freaking Hollywood or wherever the the hell they live over there, come to Toledo. I mean, we're making 30 to 50K profits per deal. If it's an A-class flip, and there's, I'll tell you right now, mate, you won't find deals anywhere in the country to what you can in, in Ohio and Michigan, right? High unemployment, declining population, that's the stigma surrounding the media and the journalists. I feel like a kid in a candy store, whatever the hell I can buy, right? There's still people living here. I mean, it's not freaking, you know, Bangladesh. It's, it's Ohio, Columbus, Cincinnati, right? Toledo, Cleveland, there's stuff going on here. So look, mate, uh, uh, I'm going off topic here, but yes, you, you have to make sacrifices. If you want to achieve a certain level of success, no matter what it is that you want to achieve, if you do not make any sacrifices, it's just not going to happen, period. Now, do you, do you attribute um, a lot of your success, though, to those low moments? I mean, they become your greatest assets, but you make it through those moments. So you're like, well, dude, if I lose everything again, you've got the confidence you can bring it back. I mean, do, do those become your greatest assets? Do you attribute a lot of what you're doing now and your successes to those low moments? Hundred percent, Josh. I mean, look. I'll tell you this: when you do well and you make money on a deal, you never evaluate the profit that you've made on that transaction because you are Donald Trump. You are the best thing ever, right? Your ego kicks in and you're top shit, right? You sit in your Porsche and you go freaking spend seven grand on a watch, right? Now, when you lose money, and I mean lose your ass, and I've lost my ass more than you, more than anyone can imagine, you're in the dumps. You really evaluate every single freaking phone call, email. I mean, the, the, the seconds, the minutes, the hours of every single day, right? And you really dig into that core problem. When you evaluate failure, 
you will eventually figure out what the hell went wrong, you will reassess and you will not repeat the same mistakes. If you repeat the same mistakes, you know what they say, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? So yes, you learn more, you, you, you learn more from failure than you do from success because you evaluate failure more than you do success. And ultimately, mate, I mean, when you are rock bottom and you can't go any lower like I couldn't, I said, I told myself there and then, I said, look, you only, I could go lower right now, it would be six feet under. I can't, go, I can't go any lower than where I am right now. When you've got nothing to lose, mate, you've got nothing to lose. Now imagine putting yourself in the mindset where you're doing well, you're wealthy, your business is good, you know, your portfolio is great, but your mindset is still, I've got nothing to lose, right? Look at Elon Musk. He sold out of PayPal, right, for $100 million, and he literally dumped every single penny back into SpaceX and Tesla, right, and he, and he, could, and he had to borrow money to pay his rent, right? That's the type of mindset where you've got nothing to lose. And, and I love it, dude. I love it because, once again, where are we going, Josh? We are going six feet under. You can't leave anything behind. Take the chance. Make the risk, and you never know, man. You you might you might freaking like you might like risk. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> now I love it, man. That's that's brilliant, dude. So you know, I, I created this podcast, bro, because I I got so sick and tired of all the smoke and mirrors and all these quote unquote gurus operating from a place of theory that have never done it. And I'm like, well, instead of bitching and whining about, it, let me go out there and interview dudes like you, right? That about that that, that went out there and built it, that have built it, lost it, rebuilt it. Um, of overcome massive adversity and out there doing it at a big level. Uh, with that being said, man, our listeners are listening to this right now because they want to go out there and create an epic business and an epic life like you've been able to create for yourself. Um, do you have any last pieces of words of advice, inspiration, motivation they'd like to leave them with to go out there and create the life that they, they, they know they want and deserve? Mate, love it. Actions speak louder than words. Stop freaking talking. Just go out there and do it. Right, um, and deal with the consequences, no matter what happens. I just mentioned that you know you will learn more from failure than you will from success. And I'm going to get a little bit philosophical here, so try and try and bear with me. But if you can have a mindset where uh, you perceive every experience to be a good experience, right? So no matter how negative it, ne negative it is, if you can perceive it to be good and find something good from that negative experience, pick yourself back up and keep moving forward. Right, and that's it. Just keep freaking moving forward, mate. I mean, you're gonna get knocked down. You're gonna lose money. They're gonna spit at you. They're gonna punch you. They're gonna bite you. They're gonna throw shit at you. I mean, it's it's gonna be it's it's gonna be a mess. But what you have to do is, is you have to pick yourself back up and keep moving forward. Ignore the noise. Don't get caught up in the noise. Right. Focus on building. You're building the tallest. Focus on you, your bigger picture, your dreams, your vision. And just, mate, just work hard. You have to work hard. Nothing comes easy, right? You really have to work your ass off. And I mean, if that, if, if that, if, if that is day and night, Josh, you freaking work day and night, whatever it takes. Uncle G. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, man. Love it. And to our listeners, I know in every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation is really just the start of delusion. Information is not power. It's taking that information, taking action on it. That creates power in our world. So um, you guys heard so much amazing advice today. Take something that you learn. Go take action on it so you can go out there and create the lives that you know you want and you deserve. And Angelo, man, I, dude, this has been a massive honor. I know how busy you are. It's past 8 o'clock uh, 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 Monday evening where you're at, dude. So it means a lot that you're here. Um, I, I honor and appreciate your time. I know our listeners do as well, bro. So this has been awesome, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, dude. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right, you guys. We will see you next time.